Hello, welcome to the Paths of Pollen podcast series. Um, in this podcast, I will try and unpack some of the content of my book, Paths of Pollen. And you'll be hearing from scientists and other people I interviewed for the book who have graciously consented to let me use um, audio from our interviews. But I, I thought I'd start with a talk I did in September 2023 at the High Park Nature Center. As you'll hear, the High Park Nature Center has been a very important source of research and experience for the book. And as the name suggests, the Nature Center seeks to educate and inform about the nature people can experience in High Park. For me, it's also close to home. All right. Oh, people are arriving. Sorry. Hello, people. I'm so glad you came. Oh, thanks for showing up. I needed someone to sit right in that seat. And that seat. That, no, this is great. The front row is populated. That's perfect. Okay, so hi there, everybody. Um, I hope you can hear me. I'm Stephen Humphrey. That's my name. And uh, uh, those are three of my pictures. Mostly this is my pictures, and most of it has to do with High Park. So uh, for, uh, for starters, this is about pollination. And so uh, the first thing I'll cover is a uh, slide, please. That's uh, Rohith turning the slides. Thank you, Rohith. <coughs> there you go. Um, Okay, so the first thing is we'll just do the basics of what pollen is. I believe that is sunflower pollen. And as you can see, pollen, which is very tiny and very hard to sort of tell the grains apart if you were just kind of looking at them as like a little sprinkles of dust on a surface, are actually very different looking things. Like that's pine pollen. It looks like Mickey Mouse ears. And those are actually like uh, air bladders to keep it aloft because pine pollen is actually transported by wind. Um, that's from squash. Uh, most, most bees hate squash pollen except for squash bees. Um, and that's rose pollen. Um, a lot of them look like navel mines or things like that. Uh, pollen is something that was kind of uh, first arrived, I don't know, 300-ish million years ago. Um, and it's, it's kind of basically uh, how plants reproduce, or it's the male information of a plant. Um, a plant, a, a pollen uh, grain has a couple of very interesting cells in it. Um, and one of these cells produces this thing called a pollen tube. So when pollen lands on a flower, that tube goes down there. So it's, it's a very complex little machine, but it can't get anywhere on its own. Can you, can you move it forward, please? Um, oh, that, that is actually more sort of the, the issue, uh, right, what pollen does. So um, once that pollen tube grows, then a couple of sperm cells go down the pollen tube, and then they, uh, one of them becomes a seed, and one of them forms a fruit and stuff around the seed. But yeah, pollen, as complex as it is, it can't go anywhere on its own. Next, please. Um, therefore, it needs pollinators, or it needs some kind of pollination to happen. Some, uh, usually, a lot of pollen actually just got kind of floats on the wind. Um, but yes, in 2019, I started work on a book about pollination. Um, I interviewed like more than 40 experts. I read a bunch of scientific papers, or I tried to. Um, and I looked at a lot of bees, flowers, and stuff across Canada. Um, and a lot of it was here in High Park. Next, please. Um, so yeah, well actually, even before that, I started by stepping outside my front door, and actually that is, I think, April, late April 2019, um, pile of leaf litter, a bit of moss growing, and uh, strawberry plants starting to grow. Um, and if you have strawberry plants, those things just keep growing. Um, 
So um, that's actually the first thing I did. I did not know what to start with first, so I just thought I would start looking around. Um, now I live on Marion Street, um, which is a little south of here, um, and if I just walk west, I end up in High Park. So that was the next place I went. Um, right, so um, the picture that you're seeing little flickers of, um, I believe is on High Park Avenue. And uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, there, there's, uh, there's, yeah, there, there, there is that, uh, there's that power thing, whatever it is. And the mural, I looked it up, is, is by, uh, is by a street artist named, sorry, Nick Sweetman. Um, and he has other, he has, has other pictures around the city, a lot of which, um, have to do with, uh, with pollination. But once I was in High Park, next slide, please, uh, is like, oh, great, so great, where are the bees? Um, and actually the first sort of inkling I saw of bees in the spring of 2019 um, was at Wild Bee Club. Um, and uh, Susan Fried actually pointed everybody to a place in the ground. Can you, can you advance the slide, please? Um, and so these little holes here that look like ants are supposed to come out of them, but they're bigger, um, they turned out to be the homes of ground nesting bees. And in fact, uh, most bees are nesting in the ground. If you can see right there, there's a little little bee poking her head out of that hole. Um, and then if you go down, you'll see like uh, you'll see like kind of a tunnel with little tunnels shooting off the sides of it. It's actually kind of a kind of a complex little tunneling system. Um, can can you can you advance the slide, please? Um, so uh, and the the bee in the hole. It may not have specifically been this one, but it, it was it was what's called the cellophane bee. Um, they dig holes in the ground, and then they kind of excrete sort of this gauzy stuff, um, which uh, makes the tunnel dry and hygienic and everything else. But um, just, uh, just kind of B101, there are over 20,000 species of bee in the world, um, over 800 bee species native to Canada, over 300 bee species native to Toronto. Um, three quarters of bee species are solitary. They do not live in societies like you'd see honeybees doing. And 70% of them nest in the ground. As you can see, like that, that's, uh, that's, that's the, a, a lot of the time um, these bees were kind of put next to a dime and photographed next to a dime so you could kind of judge their size. So that's 1.8 centimeters. So that's about the size of, of that bee. But she does have a stinger, um, just not a very big one. Um, so if she did sting you, it wouldn't feel like that much. And she would not normally sting you because she's really busy minding her own business. She has a hole in the ground and she doesn't care, you know, we don't care about their holes, so she doesn't care about us. But how do we get that bee to pose? Is that bee still alive? Why is she just sitting there? So uh, uh, advance the slide, please. So again, this is something that, that Susan taught us, is, um, is, is catch these bees. I don't know if anyone was out with her earlier, if she did this or not. Um, but once, once we catch the bees with these nets, um, put them in these jars, put them on an ice packs, and the bees cool down. Um, now, because bees are cold-blooded creatures, they just kind of get more and more torpid. And so they just kind of, they literally just kind of chill out. So they just kind of, they just kind of sit there for a while and they let you take pictures of them or they, you know, or they just sit there and don't do anything while you take pictures of them. It's, sorry, I, I'm not trying to imply that there's consent. Um, <laughs> But anyway, um, but uh, but this is this is uh, this is uh, a kind of non-lethal, non-harmful way to get a better look at bees. Could you advance the slide, please? Now, I, I thought I would show this interesting bee because uh, you have these ground nesting bees, um, and these bees are collecting pollen. They're they're stuffing pollen in the ground. They're laying eggs on top of it. They're doing a whole lot of work. Um, then you have these bees, and their work is break and enter, basically. Um, and, and so this is what you call a nomad bee, or uh, uh, the genus Nomada. Um, and this weird little red bee um, will go into the holes of certain species, go into their tunnels, and lay their own eggs. Um, and then their offspring will actually uh, kill off the other offspring. And, um, and so, and so it's, it's called a cuckoo bee because it's like a cuckoo bird. They, they lay their eggs. Um, in the habitats of, of, of other, other bees, and they, uh, that's how they reproduce. 
Um, now this bee has a, that, this kind of armored look because they are actually kind of tough and armored. And actually the reason I put it there next is because um, when we caught these bees and froze them, these were the first ones to just kind of wake up um, and, uh, and take off because they were just so tough. Um, and in fact, this one here um, is, is uh, you'll notice that, uh, that she's got kind of a, like a, this, this kind of water droplet attached to her. Um, and for a while, she actually had her head inside the water droplet uh, while it was drying off. And then she kind of left like nothing had happened. Um, anyway, next, please. Um, so now, uh, bees and wasps are very closely related. They're so closely related that, um, in fact, one scientist I talked to said they're basically bees are hairy wasps. And so they, they kind of got their ground nesting habit from ground nesting wasps, um, which their ancestors once were. And this is, a, this is a wasp that I saw a lot of in 2019, but I don't think we've seen them at all this summer. So I don't know what happened to them, um, but which is, is a sad thing for me just personally, because I, I, I just like them. Um, they, have, they, have these, they, have, they have these lovely candy green eyes. Um, they have these kind of very bee-like stripes on their bodies, so they, they really look like a relative of bees. And so we came to this sandy place where these sand wasps, surprise, surprise, were, um, and they, they dig these holes, they, they, uh, um, they lay eggs in them, and then they cover these holes up, um, and then somehow they find them again. Um, and, they, and they bring back things that they have stung with their stingers um, to, to paralyze so that their offspring can eat them. Um, now this, this wasp, she thought she would live under an acorn. Um, and you see what she's doing there is, is her offspring have finished eating all the soft parts of whatever bug it was she caught. Um, and so she's cleaning house and she's taking out the remains of this creature, which is like, I guess the remains of the thorax because it's still got the legs attached. Um, but, um, and then there's this uh, same kind of wasp, um, just would have been back there. Um, in, in uh, milkweed flowers. Um, and she's, uh, uh, wasps, while they, while they are, are, their offspring get protein from, uh, from insects, uh, they still like nectar. Um, and so they, they do visit flowers and, and they sometimes even pollinate. And there are a few species of wasps that actually even consume pollen. They're called pollen wasps. Uh, next, please. But, Living in holes itself is kind of an innovation because before living in holes, what all wasps did is they would, um, they, they were like these parasitic wasps, which are still like the, most wasps are like that. Um, they're, they're tiny little things. You wouldn't notice them except they have these very disturbing little things on their back end. Um, and what that thing is, it's not exactly a stinger. What it is, it, it's called an ovipositor. Um, so it, with that, they kind of inject their eggs into the body of, say, a caterpillar, like this poor caterpillar, um, which was not in High Park. Um, this was um, actually closer to Milton on someone's property. But yeah, this caterpillar has all these, these kind of wasp pupae hanging from its body, and it's a goner, I'm afraid. Um, but uh, uh, these, are, these, are, these are super fascinating wasps. So, um, like they, they, they are very weird. Uh, some of them are aquatic. This one is apparently nocturnal because that was taken at night. Um, and the hydraulics of kind of pushing the eggs out is kind of what became the hydraulics that push kind of venom out once they started living in holes. But living in holes was actually kind of a, kind of a, a safer way of safer life for their offspring. So that's, that's kind of how you ended up with wasps living in the holes and bees living in holes. Next slide, please. But I did mention that 70% of wasps, or wasps, bees, are living in uh, the ground. 30% are living in tunnels of different kinds, either stems or different kinds of cavities. They're called cavity nesters, because they've been found in every old thing. And uh, there was one instance of somebody finding uh, tiny bees moving into uh, uh, the lock for their door. Uh, I think there was even the story of some plane that was sabotaged by bees that moved into it or something like that. Um, I, I picked this one, uh, the small carpenter bee or, or serotina bees. 
um, because they're they're actually uh, like they're, they're, there's a, there's a very prominent researcher at York University that has kind of a knack for finding these. You find the twig, the kind of the the, the stem or the twig they live in. You find the bees. Um, and so this is actually not in Hyde Park. This is at my friend Sarah Peeble's place, where she kind of created these kind of a habitat where these uh, these small carpenter bees they kind of move in. There's one kind of you know kind of crawling into it. Um, and uh, yeah, super small. Look at that. Even smaller than a dime, right on top of a dime. Um, and uh, carpenter bees, though, these small carpenter bees are pretty much found all over the world. Um, and they have an appetite for every bloody flower. Um, they, 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 have, they have a kind of a great, you know, like they're, they're actually known for being sort of fond of invasive plants. Um, but in this case, uh, this, this Saratina bee is, uh, is sipping away at a uh, foxglove, which is a native plant. Uh, Next slide, please. Um, now, uh, I mentioned my friend Sarah Peebles, and she is uh, she's a she's kind of a composer slash installation artist, and so she got interested in first off recording bees, and then she wanted to um, look at them. So so she kind of invented these these habitats, these kind of for for cavity nesting bees, um, and there's this is the cabinet that you will see back there, um, and there's season looking into the cabinet, into these bees in the tunnels. Because you basically open the cabinet, and there's this plexiglass, and then there's tunnels. So you can see bees and wasps living in these tunnels, going through their lives. And you can hook up headphones and uh, listen to them scratching around. And burned onto it by a wood-burning artist is my little five-line poem about a, uh, a type of cavity nesting bee. What you like to say is my favorite bee, the mask bee. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, now, if can you try to play that? See if the video plays. Um, because uh, I made a video, and let's see if we. There we go. Here she is. Um, this bee is not in High Park, but. Um, Anyway, so but you can but she's related to the uh, to the to the um, uh, cellophane bees I was talking about, and here she is actually working with cellophane, um, making her cells out of it, um, and then you can see the pollen that she's kind of packed into the cells, and so you have bees that work with different materials in these tunnels, but they all have kind of the same thing. They build this kind of these little cells, which is enough room for one adult bee to grow inside and enough pollen for that bee to eat, or when it's a larva. Anyway, you can, you can move on from the video. It's like two minutes. So, um, leaf cutter bees are another kind. And so, again, it's the same kind of thing going on. You can actually see kind of that little kind of yellow pollen stuff. Um, and you can see the, the kind of the work this bee has done with, uh, with, with these kind of little circular bits of leaves. She's kind of chopped out with her jaws. Uh, the, the name for that genus of bees is Megachile, which means big jaws, and they got these kind of serrated scissor jaws, and they kind of chop bits of leaves out, and then they arrange them, and they end up looking like little Cuban cigars. And, in, and uh, um, again, these pictures weren't taken in Hyde Park, but in that, in that cabinet, um, there, there are some leaf cutters that were at work this summer. Next slide, please. There are also cavity nesting wasps, and these pictures were taken here last month. So this is a grass-carrying wasp. Here she is carrying grass, right there, to uh, like one, one piece of grass that is going to go into her tunnel. Um, and then what this wasp does is she catches crickets. There they are. There they are in a nice stack. And there she is organizing them. She'll actually kind of, she'll just kind of make them into a nice little stack and then lay, the, lay her eggs on top of them. Um, and I finally sort of saw, like, they have this grass stuffed into the end of it. In, into the end of the tunnel. And I wonder, well, how does that work? Well, so she goes in there, and then she kind of pulls some of the grass out, and she kind of drags the, uh, she kind of drags the cricket through. Um, and then she, and then she kind of, yeah, and then she arranges them very order, in a very orderly way, and then she crawls back out, and she stuffs the grass back in. And if the next video works, you can kind of see her kind of moving the cricket. Yeah. 
Yeah, there, so, so she's upside down and she's kind of pulling it over herself, right? And, and it ends up in exactly the right position. How's that for you? Um, and then what she'll do is she'll stuff the grass back in and she'll get back to work. There she is, she's stuffing the grass. Yeah, just kind of pushing it in. Marvelous creature. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, I mean, so you have these, these, these solitary bees and wasps behaving in a lot of the same ways. The only difference really is that these bees are carrying pollen. Anyway, next slide, please. There we go. Um, now, most of the bees you're gonna see um, are, are, are like are tiny little bees and they're kind of in this category of, of sweat bees. Now, I have three of these are the same bee, which is Toronto's local bee, uh, which is the Agapostomen verisens. Um, there is a common name for them, but actually it's easier to call them Agapostomen bees than to remember whatever it is, kind of green metallic stripey thing bee or whatever they call them. But, but um, And here you see kind of the way they carry pollen on their legs, which they kind of look like they're, they're wearing sort of pollen palazzo pants as opposed to kind of that kind of little kind of little ball of pollen stuck on like a honeybee or a bumblebee. And then this other kind of bee here is called the metallic sweat bee. They're small, you know, a little bit shiny if you look close enough. Um, they look like kind of ants, little furry ants with wings. Um, and they all look the same, which is why this is called a metallic sweat bee and I can't tell you anything else about it. Can you, can you, uh, can you move ahead? Um, so, yeah, uh, so, and there we go, I, it's, there are they all. Uh, it's the same bee, but the idea is that really a lot of these bees all just kind of look the same, and they frustrate scientists to no end. So, um, so sweat bees are about 4,500 species, um, and I'll do a little bit of kind of science-y language, but um, that's, they're all helictidae, and then those are like separated into like tiny little groups, or actually groups that are still very large. Um, and then Lazioglossum has over 1,800 species. Dialectus, that kind of little shiny thing, over 630 species. And um, I had to kind of, when I was writing the book, I had to trace this particular quote back because so many scientists have used, have, have kind of cited this quotation that I, I took a while to find out who said it first, but it was Charles Michener who wrote The Social Behavior of Bees, called them morphologically monotonous. So um, while you maybe can tell butterflies and moths and things apart, it seems like most bees you can't tell apart by species without a microscope. So anyway, uh, next please. However, you can kind of tell bumblebees apart because they are, oh, sorry, can you back up a second? Um, right, that was the part I was gonna get into. Um, why go to the trouble of identifying these little bees? And that's because when you're looking at sweat bees, you're looking at bees that live in holes, you're looking at sweat bees that live in tunnels. You have sweat bees that are solitary and you have sweat bees that live in societies like with queens and workers. So even though they may all look the same, they all have very different behaviors. So while most bees are solitary, you do have social bees such as, next slide please, bumblebees. They are, they are, um, a very social species. They, they're called what they call eusocial, which means truly social. I know humans feel like they're truly social, but we're actually not truly social, scientifically at least. Um, eusocial means they have a queen um, and they have workers. The workers are female, but they don't reproduce. Um, and bumblebees, they have these colonies with five to 50 to 500 individuals. They nest in the ground, mostly, um, although some live in trees and other weird spots, and it's insane trying to find their nests. So I don't have any pictures of a bumblebee nest for you. They are very resourceful pollinators, and so they, they have, so one colony of bumblebees will be pollinating anything they find. Yeah, there are over 250 species worldwide, over 40 species in Canada, 16 species in Ontario. Um, and in these colonies, um, you ended up with, with, with this whole range of kind of great big queen. Um, and then you have workers, which are smaller, 
Some are this small. I think some are might even be, that's, that's actually sitting on top of Susan's hands. Some are, I think are even smaller and they never leave, they actually never leave the colony. They just do work around the colony. And you have male bees as well, which don't live in the colony because they don't do any work. So their sisters kick them out and they just live in flowers. And I've seen a few over the summer at my own place and they just get more and more kind of covered in pollen because they're, they're kind of sipping nectar from flowers and sleeping in them and apparently not grooming themselves. Anyway, um, so, but yeah, compared to, compared to, uh, compared to uh, uh, sweat bees, they're way easier to tell apart. Uh, next slide, please. I can even sometimes do it. So, so this is the common eastern bumblebee. That's most of what you see most of the time. They've got that kind of nice fuzzy black part on their, on their rear end. Um, and then they got that one yellow band there and they got these nice kind of lemony yellow bodies. Um, brown belted bumblebee, brown belt, there you go. And then the red belted bumblebee, um, which sometimes they look like that, sometimes they look like that, sometimes they look like other things. Actually, the red belted bumblebee are completely confusing. And um, in fact, when I took that picture, I happened to have uh, a bumblebee expert on hand, Sheila Kala was there, who will be giving a talk, I think, I think the next talk. And I was like, what is that? And she's like, oh, it's a red belted bumblebee. And then whatever. So, um, so bumblebees are easy to tell apart except when they're not. Next slide, please. And then there are things that look like bumblebees and they aren't bumblebees. So that's, uh, that's, that's, that's an Eastern carpenter bee. Um, looks like a bumblebee, but you'll notice that she's kind of got a shiny backside there and uh, uh, not that nice lemony yellow. So uh, carpenter bees are, they thought they were solitary, but actually they turn out to be social bees. They actually, but they live in tiny, tiny little groups of like, you know, five of them or something. One of them does all the work and she's the queen and the other ones just kind of wait for food and things. But now we had kind of little, a little, a little kind of photo studio um, uh, in the summer of 2019 um, with a light in there. And what you, uh, what you were seeing there is, uh, is actually that a carpenter bee attacking my light because they apparently didn't like the light. So when they kind of stopped being frozen, they, they started picking fights with, with the light. And then the bee, on, the bee on this side is not actually a bee. Uh, okay, there we go. It is a Narcissus bulb fly. Um, and again, this picture wasn't taken in High Park, but I have actually seen a Narcissus bulb fly like a month or two ago. I saw one not in High Park, but right nearby High Park. So I think you might actually encounter them. There are various flies that look suspiciously like bees and for good reason because bees have stingers and so some things avoid them. So if you look like a bee, something, a predator might avoid you. And there's a type of mimicry, it's, which is called Batesian mimicry, um, which is you look like something harmful when you're harmless, such as this marvelous bumblebee mimic. Some are better mimics than others. I think the larger they are, the better mimics they tend to be, and the smaller ones just kind of look like bees, but that's good enough because predators might avoid them just because they're small anyway. Next slide, please. Such as, such as, 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 these, uh, as, these, uh, as these flower flies, which I mean, because it looks like a fly just kind of painted like a bee, right? But that's good enough to fool predators and actually good enough to fool human beings, and apparently good enough to fool bee experts because that's the 2014 cover shot for Bees of the World <laughs> featuring this fly, the black-shouldered drone fly. So uh, I, I think that's not the problem for the current Bees of the World because the author of that is Lawrence Packer, and he's very fastidious about what looks like a bee and what doesn't. Um, but I actually heard about this from Jeff Skevington, who is a, a, a researches these types of flies, flower flies or surfeit flies. And he collects these kind of journalistic mistakes. Um, and in fact, I think even his son had a math textbook with a problem about bees and it had a picture of one of these flies. So there you go. Um, next, next slide, please. Beetles are also 
uh, known to be pollinators. And in fact, they may have been the first pollinator. I think I think the earliest pollinator fossil is a, is, is a beetle. And so beetles, uh, there is, yeah, right, okay. Um, I did write this down, right. There are more than 400,000 species of beetle in the world, which is 40% of all insects, 25% of all animals. So there's lots of beetles to do everything. There's beetles that are detritivores. They, they kind of eat kind of the remains, the ugly remains of things, um, of dead things and so on. There are beetles that are extreme pests, and there are beetles that are pollinators. But one thing I've noticed all beetles like to do is they seem to like having sex. And one great place to meet up for beetles is in flowers. And so here is what a, I think is a false blister beetle having a good time with each other. And you'll notice that the head of that one in particular is covered in pollen, but they got pollen dusting their bodies all over. So you may not... So pollinators may not necessarily want pollen. They just have business in a flower. And I guess it's important to note that pollinators don't know they're pollinating. They are just doing what they're doing with their lives. But then you also have beetles that are just pests, like these invasive beetles, Japanese beetles, which uh, there are unfortunately quite a lot of. And there they are making more of themselves. So. <laughs> Uh, uh, next slide, please. Um, butterflies are also pollinators, um, and here are some pollinate. Here are some butterflies that were in high Park, such as the beautiful black swallowtail and the equally beautiful American lady. And there they are, sitting on flowers, sipping nectar from them, picking up pollen from them. Um, now, the thing about butterflies is they like nectar, and they may get nectar from any old flower they may not necessarily return to the same flower, whereas a bee will decide, I know how to get into that flower and get pollen out, so they'll tend to kind of have favorite flowers, whereas butterflies have a favorite plant, but, not ne but they, they may go to any old thing for nectar. Next slide, please. But one bee known to have, uh, or one <laughs> butterfly known to have a favorite plant is the monarch butterfly. There they are not in their favorite plant, there they are in the fall of 2019, um, uh, sipping nectar from golden rods. And this is about the time of year where they're about getting ready to go to Texas and Mexico and California. Or actually, yeah, eastern, eastern monarchs are going to make their way to uh, Mexico, look for OML fir trees. Um, and they may arrive there and just drop dead. Some of them do, actually. They just kind of, under these OML fir trees, you have all these kind of, it's littered with these exhausted monarchs. It's they, their, their, their migration is they fly up to 140 kilometers a day. Over two months, they cover 5,000 kilometers. It's the longest insect migration. It's a wonder they make it at all. But they, they, where, where a butterfly is faithful to a plant is where they lay their eggs. And famously, the monarch butterfly likes the milkweed to lay their eggs on. And they, they do have a chance to pollinate them. And if you ever watch the, uh, the documentary Wings of Life, you get to see actually it happen on screen. The, uh, the, uh, the, here's a drawing of the florets or little flowers of, of the milkweed. Um, and they have these kind of, they almost look like they have jaws. And I say, they sort of are, right? Um, or they call these things stigmatic slits. And what happens is you kind of get into that for the nectar and then you get, your leg gets caught in there, and you got to pull your leg out. You got to, you you know, pull with all your might to get your leg out. Otherwise, you'll die there. Um, and when you get pulled out, these things uh, called pollinia get stuck to their legs. And there, it's good to be a butterfly because they have long legs and they're strong, so they can actually get their legs out. And they, they may so they may actually end up be pollinating the milkweeds. What you also saw there, of course, is is the uh, is the monarch. Um, uh, caterpillar, and they just get more and more colorful as they get more and more uh, uh, toxins in them, which I can't remember what the toxins call, so I wrote it down. Can I find where I wrote it down? Um, yeah. Uh, cardenolides. There we go. Next slide, please. Now, moths, moth pollination is an area where 
people still don't know enough, but there are some kind of famous moth pollinators. And here is one famously discovered by Charles Darwin, uh, which, is, which uh, then got named Wallace's Sphinx Moth after his friend, Mr. Wallace, Dr. Wallace. But it was, uh, somebody sent him this orchid, the Madagascar star orchid. And, and it, uh, in the back of it, it has this very, very long kind of this thing kind of going down. And in that is nec it's the nectary for the, for, the, for the orchid. So if you want to get the nectar, you gotta have a tongue that's like a foot long. And, or that's what Darwin said. It says, well, obviously there's something that has a tongue that long. And then after he died, the, uh, the, the, the moth was found. But that's his drawing of what he thought the moth would look like. And, and, the, uh, and there you see uh, pollinia, again, stuck to the tongue of that moth. Um, and there are moths found to be picking up pollen on their tongues. Then this is a hawk moth uh, uh, pollinating jimson weed. In the book, actually, I talked to a scientist who, who spent a lot of time researching uh, the smells of flowers and smells that attract pollinators like hawk moths, or yucca moth. And the yucca moth is interesting because the yucca moth actually lives in that flower and lays her eggs there. But actually, what the, what the, what the, the moth does is she actually kind of packs the pollen into the, into the anthers of the, uh, or uh, into the stigma of that flower. Um, so, so they're actually very faithful pollinators. But the rest of the, but these are all kind of southern moths. These are, these are all kind of like Arizona, Mexico, Africa. So what about Canada? Next, please. Or what about the north? There are certainly a lot of moths in High Park. And these are some of the moths that I got a chance to look at. This is my favorite, for some reason, the banded tussock moth, uh, confused haploa, which we saw recently. A weird looking thing called a plume moth and a tiny little moth. And actually, uh, Richard, who's back there, could tell you more about it. But, but there are, you, you tend to find a lot of small moths um, on, on these kind of moth excursions. Um, oh, the Aelanthus webworm, which is just a pretty darn thing. Um, and this is not a small moth. This is a great big polyphemus moth. Um, and recently uh, got to see this polyphemus uh, caterpillar on again on a trip out with Richard. Do these moths pollinate? We don't know. And, and it's, it's hard to know because you have to go out at night and watch them pollinate. Now, there were some scientists in the UK who have done some studies where they collected moths um, and killed them while collecting them. And the moth study in High Park does not kill the moths. So in that sense, they won't find out if they're, if they're, uh, if they're pollinating. Um, although another study, again in the UK, found out that um, uh, they kind of, by deduction, went to spots in parks where there was more light. And where there was more light, there was less pollination. And so by inference, maybe moths are pollinating. Nonetheless, lovely things, and they're great to look at if you are a, a night type of person. Next slide, please. Such as these individuals here. And these are, this was, uh, these, these, these individuals were uh, from the, the recent, like last month at the, uh, at, the, at the moth night. And I talked to a lot of them, and they all seem to be entom a lot of them seem to be entomology students, and they were utterly delightful. They were they were like, oh, what's that one? What's your favorite? And the, and then they were full of information. They, they were they were just absolute char absolute charmers. Now this person here uh, in silhouette is David Beetle, um, and he was uh, a longtime uh, kind of expert uh, participant in the in the High Park moth study. Um, and an expert in particular on tiny little moths, which um, was handy because that's a lot of what people found. Next slide, please. Now, I mentioned that there is, there is uh, that light pollution is a problem uh, for moths for a bunch of reasons. And so are invasive species, invasive slash introduced species. Um, and one thing that uh, High Park, it well had one problem the High Park has had, such as in right here in May to, May to June 2019, um, was the was the uh, the spongy moth, formerly called the gypsy moth. So when they're saying they're spraying for gypsy moths. They actually mean the spongy moth. Um, 
I just recently found out that they changed the name. Um, I think they've also changed the name of the Gypsy Cuckoo Bee. So Gypsy is kind of is kind of being recognized as a derogatory term, um, but you may see it applied to these species. But they are they are they are um, one thing you do see at these moth nights when you kind of throw a sheet up and you point the lights at them, you see a lot of these spongy moths. So just their very presence is obvious. Again, we have the uh, the Japanese beetle. Um, now. I also put the honeybee here, um, and this may be surprising uh, because the honeybee is such a recognized uh, and beloved creature, and they're very important for agriculture, or at least agriculture as it's presently done. But in cities, they're found to be interfering with native bee species for the obvious reason that they are uh, plentiful. I mentioned that bumblebees have up to like you know several hundred bees in their colonies. Um, whereas honeybees have, have several thousand, they are communicators, um, which makes sense in the warm places they come from, um, because you find a patch of flowers, you get everybody to come to the flowers. Um, and so you have this plentiful creature with, with kind of communication skills, and so they, they take a lot of pollen, which native bees may need. Um, and so this is a study that was just published this year, um, right after I published my book. So I didn't get to mention it. Um, but uh, uh, it's a study in Montreal at uh, Concordia University, which they found that, um, there, that honeybees that are being kept in cities by urban beekeepers are adversely affecting the, uh, the diversity of, uh, of, of other native bees. Uh, one study I did manage to quote for the book um, they were saying, if people have to keep bees in cities, then you should be growing enough flowers for your bees. But anyway, uh, next slide, please. Invasiveness, or all, there are also invasive plants, um, and we'll get into that when we're looking at this beautiful endangered ecosystem in this very park, uh, Black Oak Savannah. Typo, there should be an H there. Anyway, uh, Black Oaks are gorgeous. Things, and actually, I went on a plant identification walk where I took these pictures, and the person leading the walk said that it's like walking through a cathedral. They are. They're majestic things. I included this picture of catkins on oaks because, like many trees, they are wind-pollinated. They have flowers. They're not pretty flowers because they don't, they're not pretty for anybody. They just release their pollen on the wind. Other trees catch them. And I think wind pollination is... I could be getting this wrong, but I think it's like... 20% or something of plants are wind pollinated. When we're, but oak, grasslands and oaks are all threatened. Um, nearly one third of oak species are threatened with extinction. Black oaks are highly endangered. There's less than a tenth of a percent of their previous number here. And a third of High Park is black oak savanna. And if you want to know how the province is doing preserving grasslands, well, you may consider the fact that less than 1% of the green belt is grassland, and that's probably in trouble, too. So uh, next slide, please. And this is, these are lovely. These are native species. Um, I think I, there were, I can't remember. There were like 30, 40 or something that were identified in this one walk around, um, such as Jack in the Pulpit, Wild Lupin. Um, which are, are called, uh, actually called sundial flowers because of their shape. Um, and uh, round-headed bush clover, uh, a, a native plum species, and of course the incredible wild red columbine. But we also found, next slide please, um, many non-native plants, such as lily of the valley, which is one of those invasive species which get more invasive because people think they're very pretty. And in fact, a lot of species that are invasive started as kind of horticultural garden plants. Um, I was one of these silly people who thought these things called gout weed in our garden were native because they grew so plentifully, but they are actually an introduced garden plant. They have these very nice, very, you know, kind of two colored leaves. Um, but when they really get growing, that, that stops and they just kind of, they're just kind of a solid green color. Um, and they're poisoning the ground for other, for other things. Um, and that's celadine. And then, of course, that is the, uh, that is the Norway maple, um, which uh, is, is uh, 
everywhere. Um, they started as street trees because they have no pests, uh, pretty much. Um, and they're very robust. Um, and they outcompete lots of things, including red maples. And their leaves don't turn red like red maples. So you, you actually don't get that lovely Canadian maple appearance. Um, next slide, please. So what do you do? Um, uh, one important thing to think about the fact is where High Park stops and where that you see that biodiversity that's here, it's pretty much everything past High Park is still High Park, except there's houses and streets. So it's, it's a habitat for these native plants, um, potential habitat for these native plants. Uh, there's Christina, my partner, uh, planting our garden. Um, and there are some of the plants we tried to grow. Um, that makes, makes us look very diligent, but actually none of our seedlings worked out this year. So, <laughs> anyway, uh, next slide, please. Um, and you could buy Lorraine Johnson's book. I, I missed her talk last month, but um, A Garden for the Rescue Patch, Bumblebee, uh, uh, recently published, um, has beautiful illustrations, actually kind of pencil, you know, kind of pencil illustrations, um, and just a long, you know, detailed list of everything you might possibly grow, beautifully described. Um, and that is uh, everything I had to say about it. Um, I'll just point out that uh, this is the website for my book, passivepollen.stephenhumphrey.ca. Um, and that will, uh, one, thing, one of the things it does is it gives you the date for the book launch, which is October 26th. Um, also, it will give you a link to uh, the publisher's website if you can't wait for the book launch, um, because if you buy the books now, there's actually a fairly good discount. Anyways, thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you for listening. Thank you.